Welcome to Red Team TV, sponsored by Red Team Thinking. Bad leaders react, good leaders plan, and great leaders think. Each week, we bring you new ideas and insights from business leaders, military leaders, and thought leaders. Ideas and insights that will help you think more deeply and lead more effectively, so that you can better navigate your complex world. Here again are your hosts, best-selling business author and top-rated leadership speaker Bryce Hoffman, and former Royal Air Force Wing Commander and Business Agility Coach Marcus Dimbleby. Hello and welcome back to the show. I am Bryce Hoffman. I am joined as always by Marcus Dimbleby. Hello, everybody. Great to be back for another show. And this week, Bryce, what are we going to be talking about? Well, I thought we would finish the three C's, Marcus. We've already talked about clarity. We've already talked about capability. And today, I think we should talk about culture. I think we should. Because culture is so important. Because as Deming is supposed to have said, no one can actually find the quote (laughs) from him. But as Deming is supposed to have said, and I hope he said because it's a great quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast every day. And whether Deming said it or not, it's absolutely true. We've all seen it. You've seen it in the military, Marcus. I've seen it in business. You've seen it in business. I've seen it in the military. Yep. It's 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 endemic. It is. And the best plans, the best strategies, the best ideas often just kind of get stuck in the bog of bad culture. I know. I know. And it, it's good to be talking about this because people have been saying, you know, we can't wait to hear about the third C, which is good. Encouraging that people are buying into this concept of these three Cs that we've been quite passionate about and talking a lot about, which I think is good. And as we've said, this culture of an organization, a culture of a team, of a military, of a government, it's it's how these things function. It's how they create the outcomes that they're trying to achieve. And it's all driven by the culture. As you said, if we've got a great strategy, if you've got great capability and good people, if the culture isn't aligned to the beliefs, to the behaviors, the attitudes of the organization, and the people within it aren't rowing in the same direction and supporting what they want to do and be, then you start to see the wheels come off real quick. And as you said, we've seen it in all of these different areas across multiple sectors. Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I I know that I use the the Ford turnaround as as a case study often because it's one that I know most intimately. But if you look at what happened at Ford, Most all of the levers that Alan Mulally pulled to turn Ford around in 2007, 2008, 2009, most of the initiatives, uh, creating a common global product development system, right-sizing manufacturing to the actual demand for products, coming up with with better cars that were more competitive, these, these things were in the works before he ever was hired at Ford Motor Company. And when I was writing my first book, American Icon, I sat with the leaders of each of these initiatives. I I sat with the head of global product development who told me about how he had this vision in the early 2000s at the the Paris Auto Show about how Ford could leverage its global scale by coming up with just a handful of really good underlying car platforms and then developing all sorts of models based on them. I talked with the head of quality who talked about how he, before Alan got there, had figured out how they could catch up with Toyota on quality. I talked with the head of purchasing who talked about weight, how he came up with this idea of creating these match pairs to incentivize engineering and purchasing to work together to, to, to get better parts at lower prices. All these things, these ideas have been out there. But when I asked all of these people, what would have happened? If Alan Mulally had not become CEO of Ford Motor Company at the end of 2006, they all said the same thing. They said, we would have gone bankrupt before any of these things were ever done. Because the culture, the culture of Ford Motor Company, which was so resistant to change, which was so resistant to new ways of thinking, which was so resistant to doing things other than the way they've always been done around here, which is, by the way, is a good definition of culture. Absolutely. The way things work around here, the way we do things. That culture, that caustic corporate culture where no one worked together, where everyone was was rowing in different directions, as you said, to use your analogy, 
that was going to hold these things back. That was going to make it impossible for them ever to see the see fruition. And every single one of these executives told me this company would have run out of money before any of these things ever so were completed. One hundred percent. And I think we see so many organizations now. They think that you know by plastering these values on the wall, that's what's going to set their culture and impact, you know, impact and affect their people. Or let's have free fruit bowls everywhere or bean bags and table tennis tables. And hey, we've got a funky, cool, all, you know, all singing and dancing culture. And none of that works. That is part of a culture. And even leadership style is part of a culture, but it's much more than that when you look at organization wide. And I think you know, the example of Ford there is that if people aren't aligned, if people aren't rowing in the same direction, you're not going to get where you need to be. And it goes down to, I think, giving each of those or offering each of those employees a voice and giving them the opportunity yeah. to have that voice surfaced. And in doing so, you start to encourage what I call this healthy sort of day-to-day -day attitude and behavior and work ethics that over time start to morph, you know, through behaviors into mindsets and perspectives and practices. And then that affects your culture. And that's how you can shift and maneuver your culture over time by impacting those behaviors, which you can do instantly. And we've seen this. Absolutely. And to your point at Ford, you know, when I, when I was hired by the Detroit News in 2005, I was given the choice of covering Ford or General Motors um, and by my, my new boss. And you know, I remember I standing out in the parking lot with him after my interview. He said, you got the job. If you want, which, which company do you want to cover? And I said, well, you know, you've been doing this for a long time. What, what do you think I should do? And he said, well, General Motors is the biggest automaker in the world, but Ford leaks like a sieve. And I said, well, I'll cover Ford. And, and I made my reputation getting the most intimate internal documents. I got Jaguar Land Rover's financial reports, which should, which apparently cost, cost the sale that was in, in the works. I, I got the company's 10-year product plan. I got their financial statements all the time before they were released because it did leak like a sieve. And once Alan was hired, within six months, I never got another document again, never got another leak again. And the reason why was because the people who were leaking those documents, I'll never forget this. When I, when I wrote the story revealing how bad Jaguar and Land Rover were doing, Bill Ford got really upset, understandably, and, and demanded to, to talk to me. And, and we had a call and, and he said, why do these people hate us so much? And I said, what do you mean, Bill? And he said, why do they hate us so much that they are willing to give you these sensitive documents that are doing, you, you just cost us, you know, billions of dollars a sa sale of this thing. And I said, they don't hate you, Bill. They love you. Totally misinterpreted and he it. he was like, yeah. yeah, right. They love us so much that they drive a dagger into my heart. And I said, no, Bill, these are the people who leak these documents to me are people who cared so deeply about this company. They bleed blue. Yeah. They've been here forever and they've been banging their head against the wall of your culture trying to get this ship turned in the right direction. And their, their bosses aren't listening to them. They can't get you to listen to them. They can't get any the, anyone to listen to them. And so in desperation, as a final act of, of, of trying to save the company from what they see as a you know going off a cliff, they are tr releasing this, these documents to me to try to shame you into action. Yeah, exactly that. To try to embarrass you to the point that you have to deal with these things. So Alan comes in and what does Alan do? Alan tells every employee just to your point, Marcus, his first week on the job, if you know what we could do better, if you have an idea what we can do better, here's my personal email. Here's my personal email. Here's not, not, a, not, a, not a comment box on a website not a form that you submit yeah. on an internet, in, you know, intranet portal. Here's my personal email. Let me know what we could do better. And then within a few days after this, my phone started ringing off the hook with people saying, you're not going to believe what happened. I, e, I'm a, I'm a, you know, mid-level engineer and I've been here for 22 years and no one's ever listened to me. <laughs> and I heard Alan say he wanted to hear what we could do better. So I sent him an email saying that we're doing, we're, we have this huge inefficiency in the way we do these things. And within 30 minutes, I got a 
call from his admin saying, can you please come up to, to Mr. Mullally's office and bring your schematics? Yeah. And Alan's an engineer by training. And he said, I walked up there. We rolled the schematics out on yeah. his desk. Level playing field. I showed him what yeah. the problem was. And he said, I walked out. He appointed me the head of a task force to fix this. And this happened. I mean, got calls like this all the time. And I didn't get any more leaks because people were being yeah, listened exactly to. That. As exactly that. As you said, that. people were being listened to. Alan walked in there and offered each employee a voice. Mm -hmm. And not only did he listen to them, he then took action and empowered them to take the action, which is key. You know, we know what good company culture looks like, you know, and that boils down to simple thing. It involves trust, respect, opportunity. And, and if you give those employees this option to participate, as Alan did, as we often see with our clients, and the shared values that they all have, and that's why they came to work for your company, because of what was on the wall, because of what you know was on the website. And it's doing what they love, which clearly the people, as you said, they, they bleed blue at Ford. Then you're going to get a massively different outcome. You're going to get huge gains. You're going to get massive uplift in people wanting to join the company. In your reductions in churn rates, people are going to look to stay there for a long-term you know, career future. Because they're enjoying what they're doing. They're engaged in what they're doing. They're listened to, and they're feeling that they're adding some quality value to the outcome of that company's you know, whole raison d'etre, which is what the whole vision and mission statement goes back to, what they believe you know, these cultures stem from, but they don't. The culture is the outcome of those things being affected using what we talked about earlier, the, the other two Cs. Give people clarity. Right. Give people the capability. Those two things done well will start to create the culture that you want and take it in the direction you need it to go. And it, and it's not difficult. Well, that's the thing, you know, and, and that's why we talk about creating a red team culture, because if you if you have that clarity and if you use these tools to create that capability and to give people that voice, it's amazing how quickly that begins to change the culture in a positive way. You know, one example, one of the first big companies, the first really big company I worked with back in, in 2017, right after I founded the company, before we even started training anyone, I did a, a kickoff exercise with the CEO and 300 of the, of the senior leaders from around the world. And, uh, you know, where we introduced them to the idea of red team thinking and just talked about how this was going to become part of the company's decision-making practice. And we played a little game in that session, which you know well, which we, we, we do all the time. You and I did it yesterday with the Federal Reserve Bank, which is lies we tell I love ourselves. love that game. And it's, and it's really simple. And it's just a simple game that's designed to get at the clarity, to start dispelling the fog of BS that companies yeah. create around themselves and looking at the hard truths they don't want to look at. And we did that as part of the kickoff with this company. And then there was a lunch break. And at that lunch break, one of the senior vice presidents sat down at a table I was at next to me. So I want to tell you something. He said, I, I, I don't know anything about your training program. What's going to happen is that, you know, obviously we haven't been given the details of that. But he says, you have already had a positive impact on the culture of this company. And this is a company with, you know, hundreds of thousands yeah. of employees, you know, one of the largest companies in the world, Fortune 25 company. And I said, what? We just did, you know, we just did this kickoff thing. And he said, yeah. He said, but. By having that conversation where you, the CEO was asking us to tell the truth and was listening when we told the truth and wasn't punishing us, but was celebrating us telling the truth. He said, you, you he said, you just, un, it's like a log jam just cleared here because there's so many of us have been sitting, biting our tongues for years. And what today was all about was giving people permission to say, hey, we need to rethink the way we do this. Here's my idea. Exactly. Goes back to again, offering that voice. And, you know, executives out there listening, culture is something that develops organically from the top down. It has to come from you. It can morph and grow and change, but yeah. it has to be seen to be driven and cultivated. You know, it's not something you can buy in. You're not going to pay McKinsey to come in and sort your culture out. You know? <laughs> you, whatever they tell you, don't fall for that trick. But, you know, there are systems and capabilities. It's a trap. It's a trap. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go there. <laughs> you said the N word. We're going to fall for it. But, you know, 
for me, I, I think, you know, a company culture is like this sort of ecosystem and it needs to be nurtured. It's an environment that you've got to continually think about your garden. You know, you've got to continually look after it, protect it, train it, teach it, feed it, cultivate it. I love that. And it's, and it's your job as that leader to feed those injects in where required and to allow your people to take them and run with them. And when you do, you start to see great things. And you know, if you set, what is it, you know, th- those foundations for real tangible business growth, it's no good setting them in concrete. They have to have earth. They have to be able to grow, you know, because that business growth yeah. won't grow on this solid, fixed way of working. And as we know, today's environment, you can't be solid and fixed anymore. Those those days are over. You have to be flexible, adaptive, resilient. As we talked about yesterday, business continuity with a Federal Reserve Bank, you know, what a challenge. But you have to be able to continue your business. And if your culture doesn't allow that, if it's too fixed and stayed and people within it, then speak out, then take, take a decision, take an action because of their fear or their lack of ability to do so or the lack of clarity, then you're just handcuffing yourself and everybody within. And ultimately, your business isn't going to grow in the way it can do. Yeah, you need to have a learning yeah. culture. I mean, that's the thing. You have to, you have, to have a learning culture culture that's adaptive, that's, that's, that, that's how you become resilient. Think about a tree in a storm. The, you know, the tree that is, that is inflexible and rigid is the one that breaks. The tree that can bend with the wind is the one that survives. It's that simple. And, you know, or in San Francisco, we have a saying for earthquakes about buildings. If it sways, yeah, it stays. Absolutely. And, you know, because it's the buildings that are like yeah. unreinforced concrete that are, you know, or, or masonry that are just inflexible. They're the ones that come tumbling down. And that's true of businesses too. But I want to come back to something really important you said, which is that leaders, you as a leader have to model the culture that you want to create in your organization. And I'm going to use the Ford example again, because I've never seen any leader do this better than Alan Mulally, because what he did was shocking, actually. So m- many people have heard of his famous weekly BPR business plan review meetings. After he got his, his senior leadership team up to speed on how the BPR meetings worked and started doing them, he said, here's what we're going to do, folks. Now we're going to invite guests. People said, what do you mean you're going to invite guests? <laughs> this, is, you know, this is the most secret, secret stuff here where we're running the entire global company. He said, yeah, each of you he said this to his senior leaders, each of you is going to have a couple of seats. And I'd like you to invite a guest each week, a couple of guests each week. And people are like, you mean like, you know, like our assistants to help? I thought you said we had to give the reports ourselves. And he said, no, no. I want you to invite people from your part of the business to see what we do in this room. And more importantly, to see how we do it. It's another trap. <laughs> and people were shocked. Yeah. Pe- pe- people were like, Wait, you know, the lawyers were like, wait, wait a second here. You know, we, we can't let, I mean, we talk about our finances. We talk about our sales targets. Alan says, all right, we'll put a slide up at the beginning of every, every meeting. We'll make everybody an insider and they'll be bound by the same rules we are. And, and people didn't understand it at first. They're like, this is too risky. Like, what if somebody hears something? Alan said, what, what, yeah, exactly. what do we have to hide? Yeah. We don't have anything to hide. We don't have anything to hide from our people. And so, he met it and he had the, you know, and, and when I say guest, factory workers, regional sales staff, you know, low level accountant, you know, and each after people got into the groove of it, people came up with really cool ways of, of figuring out who their guests were. So like in sales, whoever was like the best selling salesperson, mm-hmm. you know, in the country would get to be yeah. a guest at, that week, would get to be a guest next week at the meeting. Factories, the, the head of manufacturing came up with, you know, whoever, you know, workers who excelled at hitting production targets or quality targets got picked to come up. And they didn't get to speak. They had to sit on the outside of the room, but they were there to witness, to witness the way that the company was being led to see that all the talk that they were hearing in town hall meetings and on posters and, and on videos wasn't just happy hoo-ha. That this was that the senior leaders of the co- company were living the print the cultural principles of working together, yeah. of listening to each other, of being collegial, of celebrating problems because that's how you could find ways to solve them. And then those people would go back to their workplace, and they would say, "Oh my gosh, guys, 
I got to go to the BPR meeting last week. And, and you know what? They, they were, they had a big problem, but they were like working on it together and they were like helping each other out. And then people hear that and they're like, yes, that's how we should run our part of the company too. And that's so It's important. like a testimonial. Isn't right. It? It's like an internal testimonial because Alan can stand up or any exec can stand up and go, hey, everybody, uh, this week we've been talking about X, Y, Z in the company's boardroom. And everyone's going, yeah, yeah. But, you know, that individual who heard and witnessed that and then what they talk about back on the factory floor, back on the front line, that will travel far quicker and have far more gravitas because it's coming from one of their own at that level. And they're likely to believe him far more because right. he's, why would he lie? And to me, that's allowing, and this this having this transparency and bringing people in the room, you're having honest, productive conversations. And I think that's missing in today's society. And if you have those, it's going to help you identify all these issues that we talk about and we all know exist. But then you collectively form resolutions. Because even if that boardroom couldn't come up with a solution, you know that individual could take that back to the factory front line and within a day of conversation and talking about it over a brew, they'll come up with some great solutions and potential remedies to what these problems are that they're facing. And you can't buy that and you don't need to buy that. It's all out there. It's in your organization. You just go enable people to see, to understand, to have that clarity and then let them get on with it. Unleash those reins and let them go away and do what they're bloody good at doing and just watch it flourish. Because if you do that, then your job as a leader is to take those reins and let go of them and just hand them down and then sit back and then slowly and observantly watch what's going on, feed here, water there. Sometimes you may have to go back and pull back a little bit, but that's okay. But you having this sort of, you know, step back viewpoint of what's going on, the helicopter view of your organization rather than the micromanagement, which just creates more frustration for people, doesn't it? Right. Well, go back to go back to how we started this conversation with the example that I shared, you know, of all the things that were being done at Ford before Alan came in. After I'd had those conversations, I went back to Alan and I said, Alan, everybody says that all these things were underway before you you got here, many of them. And he said, yep, they sure were. And I said, what is your job then as leader? He smiled and he said, my job as leader is to clear a way for those things to happen. My job as leader is not to, to man, micromanage those people and to say, well, he, uh, yeah, your idea is pretty good, but here's how we do it better. He said, my, my job as a leader is to be an icebreaker that plows through plows through all of this entrenched, ossified corporate culture that's holding these good ideas back and make a way for them to move forward, to let these people, these other leaders execute their plans and give them the support they need. If they run into problems, if they need additional resources to help them find those, that's my job as the senior leader is to clear away and get out of the way and let them It do is. what they know how to do. This is good stuff. This is this is really good stuff. Why don't we why don't we take a break here? And when we come back, we will talk about this week's cognitive bias. Indeed. Looking forward to that. Are you a red team thinker? Are you the person in the room who is always asking the tough questions? Do you see what others don't? Do you find yourself muttering, I told you so, too often after plans have gone awry because nobody listened to your good idea? If so, then you might be. Take our free assessment and find out. There's a link to it in the notes below. I can't wait to see how you score. Welcome back. So, Marcus, you're on this week. With the cognitive bias, what are we going to talk about? My choice this week, I want to talk about confirmation bias. Confirmation bias. What is Indeed. confirmation bias? It's a tendency that we tend to find in people who prefer to go with their own beliefs and their own hypotheses. Despite what other information might tell them, they have a firmly held belief that the information they have or believe in is correct. And it can often sway and cause them to take the wrong decisions, the wrong actions, and cause a lot of frustration by others who see things differently. Well, and more than that, too, is when when you have confirmation bias, you tend to pay more attention 
to information that confirms, which is why it's called confirmation bias, what you already believe and less attention to information that challenges what you already believe. And scientists have proven this in thousands of experiments where they show people who have strong beliefs about something, two pieces of information, let them listen to two speeches or read two articles, and then they test their recognition. And they find that people have can't even remember what they just saw or read about something that they disagree with. Yet they can remember all the details of something that confirms what they already believe. Absolutely. They recall information selectively, don't they, that supports those those beliefs, as we say. And normally with emotionally charged issues, it's even stronger. Yes. And those deeply entrenched beliefs that we see in people, you, you are arguing against a brick wall sometimes with those certain individuals because of these deeply held beliefs. And it's it's a tough problem to really counter in this day and age because we're seeing it impacting business, society. And how do we go about fixing this? That's one of the questions. Well, it's such a big problem now because of social media too. Because as we all know, and if you if you haven't watched the documentary, The Social Network, please watch that documentary. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. But a, 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 as we know now, because senior leaders of these companies have, have, have shared the details of this in documentaries like The Social Network, companies like Facebook and Twitter have created algorithms that are designed to feed confirmation bias. They're designed mm -hmm. to figure out what you believe and then feed you information that confirms what you believe because you're more likely to stay on the page. You're more likely to keep clicking if it's stuff that, that scratches the itch you already have. And that's very different from how people used to get information. You know, I remember I, I you know, as, as you know, I was I was a newspaper man for for 20 years. And I remember my old crusty editors that I had when I started in my career. More than once I heard them, saw them, witnessed them pound their fist on the desk and say, God damn it, our job isn't to give people what they want, it's to give people what they need. And and that is that's that's the opposite of confirmation bias is giving th people stuff that challenges them, forces them to think differently. And today, everything's about giving them what they want. Exactly that. Because what you tend to see is when you do give them that information that challenges those beliefs, you know, tries to make them think differently, they ignore it. You know, they don't want to seek out those objective facts because what they want to do is just remember the details that are going to uphold their beliefs. And they interpret the information, even if you do give them information of a certain flavor, they will interpret it to suit their purpose and they'll ignore or often undervalue some of the key facts of that information you're providing if it doesn't align with what they're thinking. And we've reached as a result, I think, of social media, a truly crazy level of this, in, in, at least in, in you know, Western countries to, today where you get people, and, you know, there's tons of videos online of, of people doing this, but people being given concrete proof that what they believe is wrong and them saying, I don't care. I still believe it because yeah. I refuse to challenge my beliefs. And people almost take, almost taking, almost relishing their ignorance and rel you know, and celebrating their unwillingness to think for themselves and to think and to look at things objectively. And that's an extreme, but we see this in business all the time oh, too. It's, it's happening. We see companies fall victim to confirmation bias all the time. That they 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 get these beliefs, they get these these ruts in their thinking that usually usually are are, are things that support doing the what they've always done. It kind of goes back to what we were talking about with culture. You know, if if a company thinks that people will pay more for superior technology. And that's a kind of core belief of the company. And all their market data shows that people are increasingly making their decisions based on price alone. It's, it, it's very hard to get the senior leadership of that company to, to, to acknowledge that, hey, we thought that for many years, but whether we were right in the past or not, it's not true anymore. What are we going to do about it? Rather they'll fish through a pile of data to find one data point that confirms what they believe and say, see, we're right. Here's the proof. And, and if, and someone says, but what about all of this here that says you're wrong? 
they'll they'll dismiss that with a wave of a hand. Yeah. It's how and we're wired because I change know. is hard. It is. It is, isn't it? And and you've got that goes back to what we talked about previously, status quo bias. You know, you, you people want to be remaining comfortable and therefore if their beliefs are that I will stay this way if I continue with this belief, that's what they'll pursue because people don't like change. It's not a human natural instinct to embrace change. And that's why we see so many change programs struggling. And if you're going against that, and I saw someone draw a great little a cart picture, a little stick man drawing, he said, here's how these things work. And he had the cart and he had three people on the front pulling it in the direction they wanted to go, who were the believers and the, you know, the pioneers. And then you had three or four people sat in the cart who weren't too sure, but carry on pulling. He said, but then at the back, he had numerous people pulling backwards go no no this can't happen this must stay the way it is and that longevity bias status quo bias all supported by confirmation bias that these people when it's staring them in the face and the three at the front are screaming we have to go this way come on help this is happening and they're just doggedly saying no and whatever they say to those individuals are you know those facts are dismissed because it's we're seeing the thing now where people's personal truths aren't facts and they are dismissing facts over opinion and it's a dangerous place to be in. It really is. It, it's scary. It, it, and, you know, p a couple of years ago, people started referring to the fact that we live in a post-truth society. And at first people, that was kind of a joke, but now it's not a joke anymore because we really are. We, we, we have reached a point where what people believe matters more to many people than, than objective reality. And, yeah. you know, I hate to break it to you folks if you're one of those people, but there is such a thing as objective reality. And it's not based on what you want it to be. It's not based on what feels good to you. It's just objective. It's just the way things are. And you can go out and you can test and you can prove this is this is what's happening. And, you know, I think we're in a in a perfect example of this right now with the coronavirus. There's a lot of people who want to say the, the pandemic's over. And despite the fact that Infection rates currently where I am in the United States are, are going up rapidly. It's fortunately not as bad as it was. But, you know, people who studied this stuff, you know, who, who have spent a lot of time studying this are saying that, that the worst could still be in front of us. And I don't know if that's true or not, but, but I do know that the pandemic's not over. Mm -hmm. And be, just you willing it to be over doesn't make it over. <laughs> exactly. That's the thing. Wishful thinking does not make it so. Right. And, and also this... You know, is it is it ostrich effect again? You know, putting your head in the sand and ignoring these things. Is it overconfidence that you believe you are so right that everyone else must be wrong, and what you believe is the way forward? I I, I struggle to understand how people are so polarized in some of these matters today, where where what we talk often about and what we you know preach and teach is just look at all the different options, ask people different questions to get different perspectives. And having those alternative perspectives is a great way to help you overcome your own confirmation bias. And if you're willing to recognize it and do something about that is surround yourself with different people. We talk about diversity of thought. You're not going to get that on your own. You have right. to create that group. And as we talked about before the break, you've got to en enable that group then to have a voice to speak up comfortably with psychological safety. And then you've got to listen. And you've got to take it on board and go, do you know what? Maybe that is right and I was wrong. Or maybe together we've come up with a different plan, a hybrid version that is better than what we both thought. But what you can't keep doing is just doggedly saying, no, this is it, my way or the highway. Because that's just going to take you straight off a cliff. Absolutely. You know, and, and, and the thing of it is, is that there are ways of countering confirmation bias. And one of the most powerful ways, one of the things that's really incorporated into the tools and techniques we teach as part of red team thinking is seeking out disconfirming evidence. See, is, is there evidence out there? This is what we believe. Is there any evidence? Let's go on a hunt and let's actually see if we can find something that challenges what we believe that, that, that actually refutes what we believe. And if we can't, if we legitimately can't, well, then that's that's really great. We haven't, we're, we're, that's still not time wasted because we've now really validated this belief. But if there is, then let's look at this and, and ask ourselves objectively and, and, and do this in an intentional and structured way. 
let's weigh this versus what we believe and see what's right. And if you go to the roots, if you go to the roots of red team thinking, particularly if you think about the Israeli experience in the 1973 Yom Kippur War, which is one of the kind of foundational roots of red team thinking, is the Israelis had a huge amount of intelligence that suggested that they were about to be invaded by Egypt and Syria. More intelligence, more advanced warning than probably any country in history has ever had that they were about to ha- face a surprise attack. And you know, I, I won't go through all of it, but I mean, they had decrypt they the, they had decrypted the Soviet codes, and they knew that the Soviets were evacuating their diplomatic personnel from Damascus and Cairo, and that the Soviets had sorted the fleet that they had in 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 Egypt to get it out of Egyptian harbors before the war started. They had a mole in Egyptian intelligence that told them the code name of the invasion, that told them the date of the invasion, that told them the time of the invasion. The CIA called Golda Meir and said, Madam Prime Minister, you are about to be invaded. We can see it in our spy planes, our satellites, everything. You have troops massing your borders. This is this is the real thing. They had their own soldiers standing on the, 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 the banks of the Suez Canal with binoculars looking, saying, wow, look at this. Here the Egyptians are bringing bridging equipment to the Suez Canal. And here's an interesting thing. They're spraying fire retardant on their on their uniforms to, pro- to protect them from napalm. And we know, because we do this too, that when you spray this fire retardant on your uniforms, it, it, it starts to eat away at the stitching. So your uniform's going to fall apart in a couple weeks after you do this. So they're probably not doing this just for training. And despite all of this, despite all of this, despite even the the, the king of Jordan calling uh, Golda Meir and, and warning her, that, that they were about to be invaded and asking why she wasn't mobilizing her armies. The Israelis ignored all this because they thought they'd, they'd figure this out. They thought this was a bluff and they'd been bluffed before and they'd, they'd, they'd called those bluffs and they'd not mobilized and it had prevented them. It was very costly because is, Israel has mostly a volunteer army. And so mobilizing the army requires basically shutting the economy down. So they weren't going to fall for it this time. And then it happened. And in the aftermath of it, when they investigated why they fell victim to this, confirmation bias was a big part of it because they were ignoring evidence that challenged their belief that this was that this was not going to happen, even though it was right in their face. So they created a group within Israeli military intelligence called, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, but Ipsha Mistabra, which is Aramaic for on the contrary, the opposite is true. Its job was to take whatever the Israeli military establishment and intelligence establishment believed was true and challenge it, deliberately challenge it, try to poke holes into it, try to prove it was wrong so that they wouldn't fall victim to confirmation bias or other types of cognitive bias again. And they say that's been so powerful. Yeah. In informing their thinking and ever since. Yeah, it's the, the devil's advocate red team, isn't it? And, you know, that movie you talked about in. The Yom Kippur War, The Angel on Netflix, great, great film to watch. And it talks about that story of that spy who was passing that information. And even then, he he was frustrated by people ignoring it. And as you would rightly be, if your home country was going to get attacked and you had the information. And then the other great movie, World War Z, World War Z, for my American listeners over there. You know, that 10th man, the movie construct that Hollywood came up with about that Israeli red team. And it's all these capabilities that if if you have them, and you're not using them or you're ignoring them. And then the balloon does go up. Someone does invade right. or the unthinkable happens. Then who's the fool? You know, you're not doing yourself, your country, your people, your organization, your business, any favors. And as we've moved on through the last few decades, we've seen the world become more complex. And we talk a lot about the VUCA world and where we are today in business. It's a complex adaptive system. And this is why the tools we have today you know, Agile, Agility, Scrum, Kanban, all of these different tools, what they all aim to do is break things down into small iterations because we have to live on hypotheses. We don't know the answer. We're in the gray zone. And because of that, we have to test and learn. So we have to do small iterations, probe, sense, and respond, see what comes in, and then make a decision. 
But because you're doing it in small iterations, it doesn't matter that the decision you make, if it's wrong, that's okay because you're going to learn quickly why it was wrong and then you can correct it. And if you do those small, almost leapfrogs going forward, you're going to keep on track. But if you have these confirmation biases that are constantly making you think, no, keep going this way, and everyone's trying to pull you back to where you should be going, but you don't, then you're either going to find yourself going off a cliff or so far off the planned track where you need to be that to get it back is going to cost you a lot of money and the damage done along that route is often unrecoverable. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said, Marcus. Well, folks, take Marcus's advice. Challenge your thinking. Seek out disconfirming evidence. Don't just blindly look at stuff that that just simply confirms what you already believe. Really try to test your own beliefs and you'll find that it makes your thinking sharper, makes your thinking deeper, makes your plans better and leads you to make better decisions. Marcus, it's always a pleasure. Indeed. Next week, we will be back with another exciting guest. Hope you join us then. Look forward to that. Take care, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to Red Team TV, sponsored by Red Team Thinking. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and notification icon below so you don't miss the next idea-filled episode. If you prefer to listen on the go, subscribe to Bryce and Marcus's podcast, The Thinking Leader, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen. And don't forget to visit redteamthinking.com to learn more about Red Team Thinking work and Marcus and Bryce's upcoming online courses. While you're there, take our free quiz to find out how you rate as a Red Team Thinker and if your organisation has a Red Team culture. Because who thinks wins? Thank you.